Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here, and after yesterday's updates on Giga Texas and Giga Shanghai, today we have significant updates to go through for Giga Berlin, and then I also want to talk a little bit more about the Lucid Air unveiling yesterday, for those of you that did not catch the live stream. Tesla stock with another relatively strong day today, finishing up 1.4% to $371.34, compared to the NASDAQ, which finished the day down 2%. All right, so on to Giga Berlin. I think we have about four updates to go through here. The first is coming from teslameg.de, which is reporting on a tour that was given to journalists of the Giga Berlin site. Part of that tour involved a question and answer session with Evan Horetsky, who according to Teslameg has also supervised the construction for Tesla's Gigafactory in Nevada, as well as Shanghai. From some of that Q&A, Teslameg writes, quote, In five Teslas, led by Gigafactory boss Evan Horetsky in a Model X, Journalists were driven across the site and were able to ask questions. The most important answers, according to Horetsky, the German Tesla factory is currently around 20% ready, but things will really get going soon, and the first Model Y will be produced there early 2021, end quote. Later in the article, they also write, quote, definitely in the first half, affirmed Horetsky, end quote. Again, those of us following Tesla closely, this should fit within our expectations, but always good to see this reiteration. Remember, Tesla broke ground on Giga Berlin at the end of May, so if the timeline is able to follow Giga Shanghai, that would put production in May of 2021. I think when things first started, we were all pretty skeptical of that, just because China is oftentimes unique in terms of the rate of progress that they can make on projects like this. And as the airport in Berlin has unfortunately demonstrated, Germany can sometimes be in the opposite direction. But Tesla continues to hit construction milestones in line or ahead of their progress at Gigafactory Shanghai. And so far, all the news and commentary, whether it's from Jörg Steinbach or from Tesla, has been very positive in terms of the rate of progress. Not only is that progress positive for Giga Berlin, it's also extremely positive for Giga Texas, as we project that, and then for every project that Tesla has from here going forward. Tesla, over the next 12 to 18 months, is preparing to show how quickly they can grow, even while being at a relatively high level of scale. And as we've discussed in the past, I think the deflated results in the first half of this year due to the coronavirus shutdowns is going to cause people to be caught even more off guard by what Tesla does. Next on the Giga Berlin update list, we have a report from Financen, which has shared some comments that were made by Jörg Steinbach, Brandenburg's Minister of Economics. They have a quote from Steinbach from today, Thursday, which says, quote, in perspective, the Tesla factory in Grünheide could, depending on the market ramp up, have up to 40,000 employees, end quote, which is a pretty shockingly high number considering that worldwide right now, Tesla has, I believe, around 60,000 employees. Financen says that the current plans are for around 12,000 employees to produce up to 500,000 electric vehicles per year. We've heard and discussed rumors that Tesla has plans to eventually bring that up to about 2 million vehicles per year, so this 40,000 employee count would fit roughly in line with that math. If one day that does end up being the case, and I think this does throw a little bit more fuel on that fire, if that ends up being the case, and Tesla has similar plans for Gigafactory Texas, the four factories that Tesla has right now, between Giga Nevada and Fremont, we'll count that as one in this case, Giga Berlin, Giga Shanghai, and Giga Texas, we could be looking at Tesla building out capacity for more than 5 million vehicles per year from those factories. That would put Tesla's annual volume right around roughly Honda, Nissan, Fiat Chrysler, at least before the PSA merger, but even at that point, they'd be roughly the 7th or 8th biggest automaker. Does anybody think Tesla can't do that? Why would they not be able to do that? It's all about affordability, and if Tesla is able to successfully 10x their capacity, well, their vehicles are going to become a lot more affordable. And then people like to say Tesla is overvalued because, oh, they're even with that insane growth, they're only going to be the 7th largest automaker. Well, take the financials from any of those companies, and add even just $1,000 per vehicle in software revenue that flows all the way down to the bottom line, and then recalculate what those companies would be worth. $1,000 in additional software margin on each vehicle sold for 5 million vehicles is $5 billion a year. The price to earnings ratio on the S&P 500 index right now is 29. So if you apply that to 5 billion in earnings, that's $145 billion in market cap that would be assigned to those earnings at that multiple. So then what happens if Tesla's able to capture $2,000 or $3,000 per vehicle in software revenue? As Tesla's autonomy features become more robust, that just goes higher and higher until you get to robo-taxis when you're not only generating money at the point of sale from software, you're generating that recurring revenue 
So instead of $1,000 falling to the bottom line one time at the point of sale, you're generating maybe, I don't know, $5,000 a year. So let's say that 5 million vehicles that you sell in 2025, in year one, that's 25 billion in profit. In year two, that's 25 billion in profit. In year three, that's 25 billion more in profit. And then in addition to that, you shipped 10 million more vehicles over those two years. So really, in year one, you'd be at 25 billion, year two, 50 billion, year three, 75 billion, and so on. Just that, at a 29 multiple, gets you to a $2 trillion valuation. Anyway, I'm off on a tangent here. My point is that Tesla doesn't even need to get to that sort of a scenario to justify the market cap today. It just needs to capture a little bit of additional margin through software that these other automakers can't to be able to justify this type of evaluation. Software is one way to do that, further vertical integration through the supply chain or to the point of sale through owning the dealership and service network, Tesla insurance. All of these are possible ways for Tesla to do just that. And that's before full autonomy. Now, of course, the bare argument is, okay, Tesla's not gonna be able to sell that many cars. Or when you get lower in the market, Tesla's not gonna be able to sell the autonomy suite to those people. Sure, fine if you wanna think that. <laughs> I just don't agree. Anyway, let's get back to the Giga Berlin updates here. The next item comes from German publication Wirtschaftsvoka, which says that, quote, electric car manufacturer Tesla apparently wants to expand at the Grünheide site near Berlin. As Wirtschaftsvoka learned from an insider, the company wants to buy 12 hectares in the GVZ Berlin Ostfreienbrink Industrial Park, not far from the new Tesla plant. The purchase contract should largely be in place, end quote. So 12 hectares is not a small amount of land, but compared to the overall size for Giga Berlin is relatively small in addition to what Tesla has. That's about 30 acres. The Giga Berlin site is about 740 acres. So this would be a roughly 4% addition in a slightly offset location. And Wirtschaftsvoka speculates that this would be for a logistics area, possibly for Tesla. Lastly, on Gigafactory Berlin, in a couple weeks from now on September 23rd, Brandenburg will hold a public hearing to take final objections for Giga Berlin. Tesla has opted to build ahead of that final approval, taking on the risk if something were to need to be changed. I don't really expect anything material to come of this. Obviously, we've seen extremely positive comments from the regulators there, so I would expect this to be very similar to what we saw play out at Giga Texas and the public hearings that were held ahead of that decision. Nevertheless, a date to be aware of. All right, lastly today, I just wanted to give some quick thoughts on the Lucid Air unveiling yesterday. If you missed it, I did do a live stream sort of reaction to this and gave maybe, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes of my thoughts during that. That starts at one hour, seven minutes and 30 seconds in, if you want to just check out that portion of yesterday's live stream. But look, overall, I thought it was a relatively good unveiling. It was definitely a little bit too much and too heavy on the marketing. I appreciate Tesla's approach of just showing what they've got and talking about it versus what Lucid did, which was a very, I don't know, over-polished or over-corporatized type of presentation. I mean, it works for Apple, but Apple has the prestige and the legacy to sort of back up something like that without it coming off as cheesy. Lucid is not really quite there yet, but it also was not on the level that Faraday Futures presentations were from a couple years back, if you remember those. And I'll give Lucid credit because so far they've been relatively under the radar, so... Their corporate culture to me doesn't fully come across yet as being too heavily marketing focused, but we'll just have to see how that develops. In terms of the actual car, they of course announced the Lucid Air that will come in four different versions, starting off with the Dream Edition, which will start at $169,000, have a range just over 500 miles, a zero to 60 of two and a half seconds and a quarter mile of 9.9 .9 seconds, achieved with a 113 kilowatt hour battery pack. Obviously $169,000 is a really high starting price, but they did announce that they'll have three other versions of the Lucid Air, one that'll start at $139,000, one that'll start at $95,000, and then the base model Air, which is supposed to arrive sometime in 2022, which will actually start below $80,000. So I'm not gonna pick on them for their price. I think this is exactly the right move to enter the market. You would really need to have that high price at first to make sure you can afford to keep producing cars. One of the key points I took away from yesterday is that Lucid does have aspirations to become a higher volume manufacturer. From some reports online, it looks like they hope their factory can eventually produce 400,000 vehicles per year, which would obviously require some lower price point vehicles. So I think they've got the right strategy there. Basically, the Tesla strategy, start high, work your way down. <laughs> they even actually talked about their plans for stationary storage and solar as well. Not sure they need to go quite that far in copying the business model. Storage I get, solar probably shouldn't be their focus. But in terms of the vehicle, I think they've done a really good job positioning this into a different market than Tesla plays in. 
obviously the high price point, but really the overall focus was on luxury. Tesla is more of a premium, high-tech brand. Lucid definitely pursuing more of that luxury. That would be taking away sales from Mercedes, Aston Martin, Jaguar, Maserati, more of those types. Obviously there will be some competing with Tesla, and I do think they are going to end up pushing Tesla a little bit here with the 500 plus mile range, the quarter mile time, the charging rate, which they mentioned would be up to 300 kilowatts, though obviously no supercharger network. They did talk about partnering with Electrify America, but that network is expensive and obviously not as robust as the supercharger network. But the point is there are good specs there and it'll be interesting to see how Tesla responds, hopefully with a Plaid Model S and hopefully at battery day, though of course that's just speculation, we'll have to wait and see. I don't think Elon is going to be very happy though to let another electric vehicle have the longest range or the best quarter mile time. The other thing that I wanted to touch on was the efficiency of the Lucid Air. Obviously getting 502 or 517 miles out of a 113 kilowatt hour pack is pretty impressive. Lucid talked about quite a few things about the efficiency and stated a few times that they were 17% more efficient than the next most efficient electric vehicle. So I did want to spend a little bit more time talking about that. Part of the reason that it looks like to me they are able to achieve that efficiency is the design of the exterior of the vehicle. The Lucid Air apparently has a very, very low coefficient of drag at 0.21 versus the Model S, which also has an incredibly low coefficient of drag, but 0.23. But the lower that drag coefficient is, all else being equal, the less force is required to move something through the air. You can't calculate the difference in efficiency with only the coefficient of drag, though. That would be about a 9% difference if we just compared those two numbers. But we have to actually look at the surface area as well. That gets us our total drag area, or CDA. And once you've got that, you can actually calculate the amount of force required and compare the efficiencies. Unfortunately for me, there's no way to get that reference area perfectly, so we just have to kind of work with some rough estimates. But in a recent interview with CNET's Roadshow, one of Lucid's VPs of design compared the dimensions of the Lucid Air to the Model S, saying it was about 1.5 inches narrower and about 1.2 inches lower. We can use that for a bit of comparison here because we don't actually have the final dimensions on the Lucid Air, but we do for the Model S. So the width, excluding the mirrors, is 77.3 inches, the height is 76.9 inches. That can give us an example estimate of the surface area. Again, this isn't going to be accurate, there are curves and things that need to be taken into account, but just for comparison's sake here, that gives 30 and a half square feet. If we take an inch and a half off the width, and we take 1.2 inches off the height, that gives, again, a rough surface area estimate of 29.3 square feet for the Lucid Air. Again, these numbers are not correct, but they should give us a directional comparison. So if we put those surface areas in with the coefficients of drag into the formula for drag force, we end up getting values that are about 14% different between the Model S and the Lucid Air with the Model S having the higher number requiring more force to travel. So to me, when Lucid says that they're about 17% more efficient, it looks like the majority of that is coming from the shape of the vehicle. That's my hunch again without being able to calculate these values exactly, rather than the efficiency gains coming solely from the powertrain, though it does look like there may be a little bit of gain there as well. I know we've got a lot of engineers that listen to this, so if people can vet that out and let me know if there's anything incorrect there in the comments, that'd be great. Overall, my takeaways on Lucid are I wish them all the best. I think they've got a pretty good go-to-market strategy. The marketing was a little bit off-putting, but hopefully they can deliver and scale up what looks to be a relatively competitive product here that should take away some sales from internal combustion engine vehicles. I'm sure they'll take some sales from the Model S and the Model X eventually when they launch their SUV, but that's okay. Those businesses are already pretty immaterial to Tesla at this point in time, and as we head into next year and the year after become just very, very small parts of the business. So this isn't really a threat other than potentially to sort of the brand and the prestige that Tesla currently holds of being the highest performance electric vehicle. But we gotta wait and see what Tesla's reaction is because Tesla may be in a position to easily take that back. Tesla doesn't sit still and they've still got six to nine months before the Lucid Air ships. So we'll leave it at that for this episode. Again, if you want my full thoughts, you can check out the commentary after that live stream. But as always, thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe. Make sure you're signed up for notifications as well. Also make sure you're following me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast. And I'll see you tomorrow for the Friday, September 11th episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.